In a moment, you're going to hear from um, Mrs. Frida Karopkin about her new book called Thin Ice. I'm going to let her set it up and explain to you the, the genesis of this uh, work of fiction. Um, but suffice it to say that we're all familiar with the fact that one of the unfortunate byproducts of the Shoah is that many children were displaced from their families, were separated from their families, and placed in non-Jewish environments. You've probably already heard the story uh, attributed to many different rabbis. I've heard it attributed to Rabbi Chaim Weissmandel and to Rabbi Laser Silver, among other rabbis, who went looking for children after the Holocaust in convents and in monasteries because they were told that children were taken there uh, to, to be uh, hidden away and to be safe. But after the war, the convents were not prepared to relinquish so readily these children. They felt that they needed to be saved. And so the rabbis would go in into the convent and where all the children were playing and they would say Shema Yisrael. And then many of the children would come running and say Mommy, Mommy. This is a, an often repeated story and I know that it has factual basis to it. And that's how some of the children discovered they were Jewish and were able to reconnect with their roots. Others were not as fortunate. And there are probably many hundreds, if not more, who are survivors or children of survivors who aren't even aware of their Jewish heritage. So that's uh, what my mother wrote about. And um, I'm going to let her set up the rest of it. And then afterwards, we'll have some Q&A. It's my distinct honor to welcome Mrs. Frida Karopkin. Uh, this is her third book, and uh, she is uh, an author residing in Los Angeles, um, married to uh, entertainment attorney Leonard Karopkin. They have wonderful children. Uh, and great grandchildren. And without further ado. Thank you, Rabbi, and thank you, thank you for inviting me. It's my honor to be here. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all so much for coming, and a special thank you to Elaine Genesovi, who arranged all of this, and I really appreciate it. Just over 19 years ago, in the summer of 1998, I flew to London for the 60th reunion of the Kinder Transport. Actually, I flew from LA to New York, where I was met by our two sons at the airport, and the three of us flew across the pond together. The reunion was a three-day affair. For those of you who know London, it was held in Russell Square in the University of London facilities. About 1,300 people attended, they came from all over the world. There were different workshops, lectures, films, discussions, etc. On the second afternoon, we were shown a documentary produced by the BBC. To my regret, I did not take notes, but this is what I remember. In 1936, in Munich, Germany, there lived a very orthodox family. I believe their name was Buchhalter, or something like that, maybe Buchbinder. One of their children, a teenage daughter, unfortunately went off the derach, as we say today. Not only did she go off the derach, but she fell in love with a German Gentile. When she told her parents that she was pregnant, they threw her out of the house. And as was very common in those days among Orthodox Jews, they disowned her and sat shiver. The girl's German lover deserted her, but somehow she was able to live. I don't recall how. Perhaps she was taken in by friends or found some kind of shelter for unmarried mothers. At any event, she gave birth to twin girls. In 1939, just before the war, when the twins were three years old, 
the mother managed to send them to England on a kinder transport. The girls landed up in northern Wales, where they were adopted by a childless and very strict church-going couple. I don't recall the couple's family name, so we'll call them Jones. Reverend Jones was actually the leading clergyman in the local church. The girls seemed to have thrived with their, in their new home and with their adopted parents. They went to school, spoke only English, and had no recollection of having been born in Germany or that they were adopted. Certainly, they had no idea that they were Jewish. When the twins were about 13 or 14, one of them was tragically diagnosed with a brain tumor and subsequently passed away. The surviving twin, let's call her Jane, continued going to school and continued to live in blissful ignorance of her background. By the time she was 16, she had acquired a steady boyfriend, Peter. One day, Jane was sitting for one of the national exams, probably the OA levels, as they call them in, Eng in England, the invigilator of the exam, who was walking around the room, happened to look down over Jane's shoulder, shoulder at her exam paper and said, that is not your real name. Your surname is not Jones. Your name is Buchhalter. The Jones had a lot of explaining to do, and the story went, as we would say today, viral. The newspapers picked it up, as did the BBC. The BBC probably made some kind of deal with Jane and or her adopted parents, but it was at this point that the BBC cameras began to follow her life. After the initial shock, Jane did not seem to be affected or to have any interest in delving into her past. She was happy with her church-going life, happy with her boyfriend. She didn't seem to be affected deeply by the news of her adoption or the knowledge that she had born Jewish, eventually she and Peter married. It was not until quite a few years later, after her son was born, that Jane began to become interested in her background. I don't recall if this was sudden or whether it came over her gradually. However, with the help of the BBC staff, surviving members of the Buchhalter family of Munich were traced and located. It was discovered that Jane's biological mother had ended up in the camps. One branch of the Buchhalter family was found to be living in Brooklyn, New York. The BBC brought Jane to the States and the film shows her surrounded and welcomed with open arms by a swarm of cousins and other relatives. The Buchhalters are orthodox. The boys wear their tzitzis out and have long pairs. Of course, this was all very foreign to Jane, and she was overwhelmed by all the Jews and the Jewishness. The Buchhalters gave Jane a photograph of her mother. Jane returned to London and decided that this had nothing to do with her. She resumed her life in Wales with Peter and their son. In the meantime, the BBC were trying to discover who Jane's biological father was and what had happened to him. They managed to trace him to Dresden, Germany, which was still at that time in communist East Germany. Apparently he had married, had fathered a daughter, and subsequently died. Now Jane learned for the first time that she had a half-sister. The BBC brought her to Germany, and the film shows the two sisters meeting for the first time on the platform of a railroad station. They fall into each other's arms, embracing and crying with joy. Before Jane left to go back to Wales, the sister gave her a photograph of their father. The last frame of the documentary is a shot of Jane sitting in her bedroom at her desk. On one side of the desk sits a framed photograph of her Jewish mother. On the other side sits a photograph of her German father in his Wehrmacht uniform. Jane and her husband Peter were in the audience watching the film with us. After it ended, Jane was available for questions. 
she was asked about their son, who was not present. He was having trouble, apparently, coming to grips with his mother's past and had refused to attend. In answer to another question, Jane said that she had no interest in her Jewish origins and was happy with Peter and her life as a church-going Christian. This story had been nagging at me for years. In fact, on several occasions when I talked to my sons and asked them if they remembered the documentary, they also said that not only did they remember it, but that it had left a deep impression on them. The question I could not help asking and still ask is this. As the rabbi said, how many more Janes are there out there? Children who were left with Gentile foster parents and whose parents had every intention of coming to reclaim them but never survived. We have statistics for the Jews we are losing through intermarriage and assimilation, but there are no statistics to tell us how many Jews we have lost in this way. Unclaimed Jewish children who were adopted, baptized, and brought up as Christians. It is not only they who are lost to us, it is all their children, their grandchildren, etc., untold future generations. I felt I had to highlight this, even though I knew that nothing could be done about it. However, I could not figure how to write about it without fictionalizing it. This presented me with a dilemma, because I myself do not like to read fiction about the Holocaust. I believe there are sufficient life stories from survivors. I don't need to read fiction. But finally, I decided that it was only through fiction that I could bring this subject to light. Because of my feelings about Holocaust fiction, as a sort of compromise to myself, I tried to use my book as a bit of a teaching tool about the Nuremberg Laws and the plight of the Jews in Nazi Germany in the hope that young people especially, who are probably not learning anything about that time in school, might read it and get something out of it. And as long as I was at it, I threw in Israel and a romance. I believe strongly that just as we're trying to educate future generations about different aspects of the Holocaust, about concentration camps and gas chambers, and the many other atrocities perpetrated against our people, so too we should not forget to pass down this, this story, the story of the generations we have lost because of the children that were never reclaimed. And who knows, just as today, centuries after the expulsion from Spain, we hear of descendants of Muranos who are returning to their Jewish roots, so too, perhaps in the future, we will hear about Christians who have discovered their Jewish roots and who were lost to us in the Holocaust and who wish to return to the religion of their ancestors. Tribal imprinting is an intriguing concept. Thank you. I'm going to try to uh, lower this lectern so that my mother can be seated while we're having a conversation with her. I hope it works. I think it'll work. We'll give it a try. What I'll do is I'll get a chair. Maybe you can all hear me even without the chair. Here's what I'll do. Okay. okay. So you'll sit over there. I'll sit on I'm going to lower the video. <laughs> there we go. Got that. Okay. So the mic will be with closer to my mom because I think you can hear me a little bit better. I just wanted to ask, so I really enjoyed the book very much. And I read all of it, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> when it first came out. I wanted to ask you, 
May I call you Mrs. Korobkin? <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you, <laughs> um, you know, you spoke about how deeply impacted you were about this experience of the Kinder Transport reunion in uh, 1998-1999. But invariably, for those who may not be that familiar with your own background as a child of the Kinder Transport, there must have been some part of your own life that came out in the characters and in the narrative in the story. Perhaps you could shed some light on that as well. Well, I think every author brings something of themselves into their uh, writing. So uh, I was actually uh, living with the three different Christian families during part of World War II. So that part of it, I was able to reproduce a little bit. And um, can, can you start at the beginning? Uh, how did you end up? First of all, you were on the Kinder Transport. I was on the Kinder Transport. So tell us a little bit about your family. You were born in Vienna. Tell us a little bit about how you got on the Kinder Transport. And yes, well, my, my, my father had heard, some of you have heard this story before, but uh, uh, my father had heard through the Aguda Association in uh, Vienna, where I was born, and I had three older siblings, and he had heard that this young rabbi in London, Rabbi Solomon Schoenfeld, uh, was trying to bring children out, and through the Aguda Association. Some children he knew were being sent to Holland, and he was very, very um, insistent that we not be sent to Holland, that we go right to England, and probably saved our lives as a result. So I ended up in London just before, uh, it was actually the end of 1938, before the war, the Anschluss, the, the uh, annexation of Austria had already occurred in March of 38. The Germans were already in Vienna when I left, but the war had not started and did not start until September of 39. So at that time, I was living with a Jewish family in London. Rabbi Schoenfeld had billeted all of us out to make room for new children who were coming in on the other kinder transports. And they sent me with all the other, and all the schools were being evacuated, not just Jewish children. And I was evacuated to the countryside where I was billeted with three different Jewish families for the next couple of years of the war. Jewish or non-Jewish? Uh, Non-Jewish, sorry. Non-Jewish, Christian families. And, and how long were you there uh, with those Christian families? I was with those Christian families until 1943. So how many years is that? So 39 to 43. I'm, I'm not very That's good four. at math. It's about four <laughs> years. And, uh, Close to four years. And you were how old at the time? I was six when I came to England, so you can figure it out. Not so, quite six. So those were very formative years, from the years of six to ten years old. You're living with yeah. non-Jewish families. Yeah. What, uh, what memories linger with you with those, in those families, and what kind of well, I, conflicts I, or challenges did you have during that time? I, I knew I was Jewish. Unlike the heroine of my book, who did not know she was Jewish, I was not adopted. I knew I was Jewish. And uh, I remember it actually quite fondly. I, I, I love Christmas. <laughs> but just as a dis we never had Christmas at home, <laughs> even though you liked it, yeah. So, um, um, but but did you ever feel that sense of guilt that eating that Christmas dinner or whatever it was that you? I were did at first, but I had an aunt who, unknown to me, was not orthodox who said, I have to eat everything. This is an emergency time, and I should eat everything, concentrate everything. So I did. Well, she was probably right. I mean, for a child like that, you know, you really didn't have any choice. I'm sure your parents would have told you the same thing. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, so you, uh, what I was getting to in, in talking about your own family history, so you yourself spent a few years with non-Jews, so you can certainly sympathize with the character. What I found fascinating in the book, without giving away any spoilers, is that the young uh, lady who's the main protagonist of the story comes from a German family 
in which city was it again? Was it in Berlin? Frankfurt. It, it was Frankfurt. in Frankfurt, right. And this is, <laughs> this is a, a, a real Yekisha family. Um, the, the, the patriarch of the family, who would eventually be this girl's grandfather, who's, who dies in the war, is really a, a, a classic Yeke who's a stoic in many very ways. Very Teutonic, very, very Teutonic. Very yeah. Teutonic and yeah. you know, very proper and, and very formal. Um, and that certainly contributes to the narrative. But it seems, knowing the background that you come from, um, at least your parents were not Yekes. No, we were from, they, New, from Poland. They, you, the family was living in Vienna, but you were from Poland. Your father was Hasidish. Your parents, your parents were Hasidish. And yet, when you were brought on the kinder transport to London, tell us a little bit about the Jewish environment that you found yourself growing up in outside of those years when you were living with non-Jews on the countryside. Well, um, this, this family that I was billeted with before the war started were not actually Shomer Shabbos. They couldn't, Rabbi Schoenfeld and the Aguda could not, did not have the time to really check everybody out that well. So, for instance, they took us to shul Shabbos morning, and in the afternoon we went to what we call the flicks. <laughs> you know what the flicks are, yeah. the movies. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but they were really kosher, and they kept all, you know, there was Pesach. I don't remember Sukkot there, because I think by Sukkot I was already evacuated, but we, I remember Pesach there. Right, but then, and then after, you know, in 43, yeah. After you left those yeah. Christian families, well, you came back to London. No, right? no, no, where, no, no, no. Where'd you I go? Went to Cardiff. You went to Cardiff, and where were you? My brother there? was in a boys Orthodox boys hostel in Cardiff, and they had finally took in girls, and that's where I stayed until the end of '43, and then I was sent to Rabbi Schoenfeld's school, which was, he had he had started the first Orthodox Jewish day school, in all of England, and they were evacuated to a little village in Bedfordshire called Shefford. And that's where I spent the rest of the war, until, mm-hmm. until 45, middle of 45, when, um, uh, when, when the war was over. And would you say that Rabbi Schoenfeld's approach and the school's approach that you were in in England yeah. was more of a Hersheyan kind of uh, Very Jewish. Hersheyan, and all of our teachers, almost without exception, were Yekas. So I was very familiar with the Yekka way of life, with the Yekka pronunciation. I still pronounce a lot of Hebrew words in the Yekisha way, um, if I forget myself. And a lot of the tunes, the Nigunim, the Yekas, the Yekish, with the Davening, the whole Nusach of the Davening, I remember the Yekisha Nusach. So in many ways, Rabbi Schoenfeld himself, was he a Yekke? No, he was born in England. He was born in England. But, but and, he he was, was, and he was educated in the night for yeshiva in Czechoslovakia. Right, but there was a tremendous uh, Hersheyan influence in the, yes, the English definitely. scholastic system. Yes, there was a special emphasis on Torah Bervoda. Torah and Derech Eretz. And Dere, Torah and Derech Eretz and Torah Bervoda. Right, right. Okay, um, is there going to be a sequel to this book? Because it ends in the 1950s. Do you want to tell people like a little, just approximately about the ending of the book? The ending of the book is at the time of the 56th war in Israel. And uh, that's where the romance occurs uh, around that time. I have been asked to do a, a sequel and there is certainly something that could be made into a sequel, but the only way I would do a sequel is if I could use another, some kind of learning tool, uh, like I did in this book where I talked about the Nuremberg Laws and uh, things like that. If I could find something that I could educate people about, then I would consider doing a sequel, but otherwise I don't see the point. It's, I don't see the point of just writing a novel. Okay. okay. Um, uh, uh, do you know, uh, do you have any uh, acquaintances or friends uh, or people that you met at the, um, at the Kinder Transport reunion 
who went through that kind of experience, only discovering later in life that they were Jewish? No, I still have friends who were with me during the war in Rabbi Shemuel's school in evacuation. Um, but I don't think that right now, and some of them had been with Gentile families, as I was, before they came there. But unfortunately, some of those friends are no longer with us. And um, those that uh, I do know, I don't think were with Gentile families, I'm not sure. Now, uh, Rabbi Schoenfeld School, you know, just, to, just, just to explain, the kinder transport took 10,000 children from... No, yes, 10,000 10, children were brought to England on the kinder transports. Rabbi Schoenfeld brought 1,000 of those 10,000. You've all heard of uh, Sir Winton, um, you're right? Yeah, he recently passed. He away. recently passed away. He was, I think, over 100 years old. Yeah. He, was, uh, he, he brought over a lot of children. And just a few years ago, I happened to learn by chance that El Eleanor Roosevelt, outside of any government association, not her, her husband Roosevelt was not involved, uh, she herself, with the help of the Quakers, may have brought at least 5,000 children to America uh, that is, nobody talks about. Right. So with those, out of those 10,000, 1,000 were brought by Rabbi Schoenfeld, right. and they all came from Orthodox oh, homes. I think so, yes. But not all of them remained not Orthodox. Not all of them, no, no, no. But, uh, but it was a heroic I think effort. I think most of them did remain Orthodox. Most of them did, yeah. Right. Even though some of them were reunited with their families? Very few. And some of them were not. Very few were reunited with their families. Some had one pair that may have survived, but not both. And then how did you end up... Uh, so after the war, what happened to you? Like, where did you go after the war? After the war, we were all in a hostel uh, in London. A hostel meaning like an orphanage. Like an orphanage. But uh, we were all waiting to hear what had happened to our parents. It took a long time to... I didn't find out until, uh, as I wrote in my other book, until the late 70s, what had happened, that they had been killed. They were on their way to Palestine, and they were killed in Yugoslavia, right, when, when Yugoslavia was overrun. So, um, yeah. And, and so you lived in the youth hostel until you were how old? And then I went to Israel when I was 17, and lived in Israel. For, we, we were all very much educated in Zion, in religious Zionism at my school. And a lot of the, of my, the older kids had gone on Hakshara, actually, and were already living in Israel. So at, in 1950, I went to Israel, and I stayed there for two years until I realized that I was about to be called up and I did not want to go into the army. So I went back to England and worked there for a couple of years. And then my aunt in America, sent me papers, and I came to America, where I met my husband, and the rest is history. <laughs> Why did you uh, want to leave England? What made you want to leave England? You know, it, I, it, I was, my sister was married to um, this very, very extreme Hasid, Satama Hasid, who wanted to control all of our lives. He was in a Turakata, one of the heads of the Turakata, and I just felt suffocated. So. Now, but that's very interesting. You said you went to a school yeah. that was Torah in Derech Eretz, in Zionistic, yeah. and yet you have three older siblings, or had three older siblings, and they all grew up more in the Hasidic yeah. worldview. Why, why were you, is it because you were the youngest that you were indoctrinated well, into? I, the, I guess I was indoctrinated at, the, you know, at Rabbi Shomfer's school. And they were already old enough they to? They were old enough, but yeah. So, do, or do they view you as a sort of I'm, a black I'm the, sheep? I'm the black sheep. <laughs> even though you and my least, son is also the black even sheep. Even though you were <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> even though you were the least amount of black out of the whole family. Yeah. Right. So, um... No, no. It, no. He, may, I, may I just Please. say that... We, we are the black sheep because I, I told my brother that we eat gebrachts on Pesach. 
<laughs> so did he, did he tear Korea? <laughs> I mean, you know, that's the kind of extremism that I, I, I've always fought against and, uh, you know, live and let live. And yet you lived for a while with lived, your sister yeah, yeah, and, her, lived, and her husband. Yeah, yeah. With you the, even, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, but when you, your brother-in-law, who was, uh, his memory should be a blessing, he wrote the only book in English on Naturi Karta theology and ideology. Called, and it was called The Transformation. It's called Transformation. I have an original copy in my home. And um, you had actually helped edit yeah. and, and spell check the book. <laughs> yeah. Is that right? Yeah. So um, <laughs> did, how did you feel about doing that as a Zionist, uh, you know, helping it was, your brother it was, publish it was, a book? It, it was very material. difficult because you had to know my brother-in-law. <laughs> I mean, if I said to him, you should forgive me, he, he died last year or the year before, Yisrael, that's not how you spell it. After all, he was Polish and he, he was just a brilliant man. He picked up English beautifully. I said, but that's not how you spell it. He said, oh yes. I showed him in the dictionary. He said, the dictionary is wrong. <laughs> so, so that was the kind of environment yeah, that, that you the were kind, looking yeah, to? Right, to escape. To escape from. Okay. All right. So you came to the United States, and uh, you met your future husband. Now he was a nice yeshiva bacher. And no, he was not a yeshiva bacher at all. <laughs> I'm sorry to, I'm sorry to tell you, you don't have that much yichus. <laughs> you always taught me that we make our own yichus. That's, that's, right. that's right. Right. But uh, so, how did you meet him? I mean, he wasn't from a, he was from a traditional family, yeah. but he wasn't from a well because um, his mother was related to my cousin's husband, my first cousin's so husband. So they made the shit up. I mean, it was like a blind date. It was a blind date. All right. And he and took and his mother kept begging him, call her, please call her. She's family. And he said, I'm not taking a number from my mother. <laughs> and I told my cousin, I'm not going out with a guy who takes a number from his mother. <laughs> but eventually you went out and it worked out. How did your family, your siblings in, in England, how did they react? Well, to my brother actually came to the wedding with his wife, who was no longer alive. Uh, they actually came to the wedding. Or, or did he? No, wait a minute. No, he didn't come. He came by himself. He came by himself, right? He came by himself to the wedding. So no, he was shocked. He was shocked? Yeah. Because? Because, I mean, it was a, from wedding, but there was dancing. The ballroom dance. <laughs> In those days, it was accepted. In those days, it was accepted. Our young Israel in Jackson, in 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 New York, had ballroom dancing at their banquets. In those days, it was accepted. Right. Not not that we're going back to those days. <laughs> those days were those days, and, and there was a time and a place for it. But, um. So, but but you've stayed in touch over the years. You, you now, uh, how many are, of you are still alive among your, the original four siblings? We have three, three left. Three, uh, thank God. And uh, you've always stayed close with, um, relatively close. Well, with, I mean, we're in touch, yes. Yeah. And, and, do you, and would you like to reflect upon how your life has turned out versus how their lives have turned out? And, well, I see that in the Hasidic community, um, Things are not that great today. Um, in my brother's family, um, there are some divorces, which thank God, and I hope never will be in, in, in my family. So there is a little bit of, I, I, I'm, I'm not very happy to, 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 that we turned out the way we are. You're happy that you turned yeah. out. Can now, I, and, and if I can ask you to reflect on this, I don't know if you have any frame of reference, but you knew your parents. You knew your parents until you were six years old. 
so you didn't know them well, but based on everything that you knew about your parents, do you think that they would have been proud of the life choices that you made for yourself and the direction that your life has gone, or do you feel that they were more in, firmly planted in the Hasidic community? I have no idea. I think that they would probably frown a little bit on um, some of my life's choices, but I think they would see, see that my children haven't turned out too badly. Okay. Let's open the floor on that note. <laughs> okay. Yes, please. Well, we, we just talked about it that, oh, my third book is it's just a little pamphlet. It's called How to Get Along with Your Children's In-Laws, and it's tongue-in-cheek. It's... <laughs> yes. This is Brock, and I'm, uh, I'm interested to know how you made the transition. Your previous book was more based on truth and fact, and now you've written a work of fiction, which is a whole different is that? I need, the question to, is, I need something to drink. Okay. Um, um, we're we're going to get you something need, to drink. I need a drink. I need to drink. Okay. Okay. The question that uh, Nani is asking is... Um, okay, my, mom, my mom hasn't been feeling so well. But uh, the question is... The transition from uh, non from nonfiction to fiction. How how did you how were you able to handle that? That had you had some work with uh, experience with creative writing? Or? No, no, actually not. Actually not. I just read a lot. Would you excuse me a minute, please? Yeah. Have to. Yeah, I'll, I'm going to do some show tunes now. <laughs> Uh, yes, please. Um, the title is Thin Ice because the, okay, it's basically, this is a, a multi-generational story. It's a book that's really in two scenes or, or two, two periods, two eras. One is uh, pre-war 1930s and the other one is in the 1950s after the war. Um, and it, it's really based on two very strong women. One is a young lady that my mother described before as based on this character who fell in love with a, a German. That's the mother of the protagonist in the second part of the book in the 1950s. And unfortunately, her end does not end well. But how did she meet her German lover? She, was, she loved skating, and her parents gave her skating lessons and her instructor was this German fellow before the war and he was very charming, very debonair and he sweeps her off her feet and uh, quite literally and as a result um, she ends up uh, expecting a child out of wedlock and that's really the, the springboard for the rest of the story so it's called Thin Ice it's the metaphor for this uh, young lady yes, Mary I could address this to you, Rabbi Croft. I'm curious about the, the reunions. How often are they? And I'm just trying to picture them because you have people like um, Mrs. Croft, and you have people like Jane, and you have all this, all these people coming from you, you know, and, and living different lives and having developed into different lives. And I'm just wondering how often do these take place, and why was Jane willing to be interviewed if she was kind of supposedly so happy with what was happening? I, I, I would assume... Here, Mom, Jane Mom, Mom, come over here to the mic. Deal with the BBC. I can only assume, I don't remember, I didn't take notes. Mom, come over here to the mic so that people can hear you. How often are the... So the... Um, uh, we only went to one reunion, which was the 60th anniversary of the Kinder Transport. So that was 1999. Um, 98. 98. Because um, I think you went in December of 38. Is that, what, is that when you went? Yeah. There had been one 10 years before the 50th anniversary of the Kinder Transport. I didn't go to We did not go to that one. 
And then there was one 10 years afterwards, which was much smaller, unfortunately, 70th anniversary. So I only think that there were three uh, reunions. I don't think there was an 80th anniversary yeah. because people were really probably uh, too, old, too elderly. But uh, so that, was the la that one was in uh, 98. <coughs> and, uh, and we winded up. So that's close to 20 years ago. Yeah. yeah. Let's wind it up. Yes. Um, I'm interested in each other, and I'm not sure if, well, I know you were young, too young, but what went on with the tender transport? Do you have any recollection of anyone here in the audience uh, know the process? How did, how did you go from place A to B? What were the conditions like? Um, do you have any sense of, of what took place? I remember my father taking us to the railroad station. And when we got to England, we were taken by train to Liverpool Street Station in London, where today there is a monument, a, 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 a statue to the kinder transport. But I don't recall too many details, and I certainly don't know the process. I was told that the Aguda people in London were even working over Shabbos to get the children out because it was, it was such an urgency. Because remember that once the war started, the kinder transport stopped. So they just had from the end of 38 until the beginning of 39, uh, till, end, till end of August 39. September 1, it was all over. During that time, um, I was wondering, um, I'm wondering how safe it was um, to, to undertake such a journey. I know the war had not started, but there was a lot of, um, of anti-Semitism going on, a lot of um, un unrest. Here are kids going on a train. Uh, we know what train it was who sponsored it. Well, there were there were adults on the train with us. There were volunteers and on the train with us. We went to Holland first, and Holland was not was not the, the war hadn't started yet. Holland was we were fed in Holland. I remember it was a, a, a school, and then we went by ship to Harwich in England, and from there by train to London. Please. Um, my mother was 18 months when she went on the kinder transport. She was the youngest. 18 months? Wow. I didn't know they, let, they, they had anybody that my young. My aunts were six and eight as well. Wow. Wow. And did, did their parents get out of the My survive? grandmother got out, which is a story by the grace of God that she got out and she came to England and they were all in three different foster homes. And one of my aunts was with a Gentile family and my grandmother got her back just in time. She found out that she was going to be baptized. But the, my mother and another sister were with Thank Jewish you. families. Wow. And uh, isn't, isn't there a story about how one of the Gentile families wanted to keep you? They wanted to adopt you? No. <laughs> <laughs> but, but your sister, your sister came and... No, my sister came and kidnapped me, but because the people in London were still in charge of me, and they didn't want me to join my sister and brother in Cardiff. Why didn't they want you? They were probably being paid by the refugee committee. Uh -huh. Okay. Yes, please. Um, Canadian Jewish Congress and the American Jewish Committee both brought in tens of thousands of kids who had arrived in England on the kinder transport. And my parents had adopted two orphans from Vienna. And uh, they were 14, year old, 14 years old when they arrived in Toronto. And they didn't speak a word of English. Wow. Um, German. And uh, my father spoke German. 
and uh, it didn't take them very long to master English. And they lived with us until they finished university and got married. Wow. That's, a, that's incredible. That's amazing. We, when we were on the Kinder Transport reunion in 1998, Sir Richard Attenborough, those of you who know who that was, was a famous director. director and producer. He spoke because his family had taken in two German girls um, and raised them. And he was very emotional about it, about how these were his sisters and that they were adopted by his family because they were refugee children. It was a very common story. A lot of Gentile families did this. Yeah, any, yes, uh, um, John. Um, you may have started to answer the question earlier, but I'm just curious to know how you developed the literary skills to write a fiction. I've always liked to write, and even when I was in school, I, I always wrote articles or whatever. Did you ever teach? I did teach I for one year, good. yeah. Mm -hmm. I taught English literature. Right at, the, at the local children's school. Alan? Did you ever continue the relationship with the Christian family? Did you ever continue the relationship with the Christian family? No. 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 Some people did, but I didn't. You had no interest in I don't know what happened. I, I, I just, I, I don't, we didn't. Yeah. Yes. Rabbi, how did you feel? Did your mother talk about this a lot while you were growing up? And how did you relate to it if she did? I don't know. Some people don't talk about their past during those times. And how did you adapt? Well, that? you know, it's interesting. You know, uh, <coughs> our mom did not go into a lot of the details. I do remember very distinctly her receiving the letter that, uh, in this 1970, I don't think, was it the late 70s or the mid 70s? I, I seem to have been 73 quite... 73 maybe. Maybe it was 73, because I, I was quite young. But I distinctly remember my mother getting the letter and crying when she read the letter about her parents being part of this list of Jews found in a communal grave in Yugoslavia. But other than that... I did, no, I didn't talk about it no, when the kids didn't. were growing up. But then as they got older and they were saying, how come we don't have grandparents? And all the kids had grandparents. How do, and, and no aunts and uncles who were all in England, you know. I will tell you this quite interestingly. Um, part, I believe part of the reason why I chose the career path that I chose was partially because I knew that I had a grandfather that I had never met who was a rabbi. And I felt, perhaps part of me felt that I had an op, op, an, a responsibility to carry on the legacy that he was never able to, to live. Um, but also, I also remember very distinctly my mother being very anti-Hasidic. And I thought that growing up that Hasidim were bad people. Because, um, because my mother usually did not have a kind word. Are you okay? Mom? Okay. Yeah. Can we wind it up? Yeah, we'll wind it up. Anyway, so I came to love Hasidus later in life, despite my mother. <laughs> but anyway... In the, despite or in spite? Or, oh, no, I don't know if it was in spite. <laughs> Maybe, who knows? We'll have to speak to the psychologist. Thank you very much. Thank you.